Good morning. That's an unofficial good morning. So you'll get your official good morning when Dave comes up and begins our service today. I do want to share a couple of announcements that we have uh, coming, things that we have, events coming up. Um, if you'll notice on the back of your bulletin, we're talking about our annual district conference. Uh, for those that don't know, we are part of a community of churches of the brethren that is here in Idaho and western Montana. And I keep adding western Montana, even though there's not a church in western Montana, because I just won't let it go. Eventually, we're going to get a church there, and it'll be fantastic. But for right now, we have this community of churches that uh, is mostly in the valley here. There's one in Twin Falls. And annually, we get together, and we celebrate uh, what God has been doing in our individual congregations. We do a little business and some different things. This is open to everybody. You're welcome to come to this. We have some wonderful speakers that are going to be there um, giving us, uh, leading us in worship. And so you are all invited to come and participate in this uh, on the 11th and 12th. And if you've noticed, it's mentioning food. And so uh, both uh, for you to participate in helping with or, uh, or just coming and partaking in. So that's, that's what we do around here is we eat. Um, we had a wonderful time last night at our ice cream social. If you missed it, it was terrible. If you were there, you know that I'm not telling the truth when I say that. It was awesome. Um, and, but we had, it was the perfect number of folks. We had a great celebration and really enjoyed the music from the Fiddler's Express. They did a great job. So it was fantastic. So that was, I'm not telling you about stuff that's already happened, although I did a little bit there. This is coming up, so we have these things. But between this and today, there is another district event that I want to encourage you to attend. It is the, our district hymn sing. This time it's going to be sponsored by Boise Valley Church, and so we want to have you come. It's at 4 o'clock on the 29th, the last uh, Sunday of this month, and so they will provide us with a light meal, uh, and we'll just sing and lift our voices and enjoy some fellowship. It's pretty low bar as far as... Uh, what's required of us other than just to come and lift our voices in song. So that will be at Boise Valley Church, 4 o'clock on the 29th. District Conference, him sing. I'm done. Dave, could you bring our service? Yeah, let me mark out the ice cream social we had last night since John mentioned it. But... For those that missed it, you really missed it. I mean, uh, I'm here to tell you. I can't tell them about the great homemade ice cream, the strawberry, the peach ice cream. Oh, Marianne, you killed it. And, oh, should I get to this? Oh, but, yeah. But uh, the past is our future. So the next ice cream social, you know, you better be there. Uh, I want to say welcome, and <laughs> someone's late, uh, but <laughs> uh, yes, yes she was, and I want to say welcome, and for those that are visiting, I hope you find this as your home church and feel welcome, and um uh, we're just glad to have you all here, and I hope you feel the fellowship we have today is in the meaning of God. So our uh, scripture reading is 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 15. Everything is permissible for me. This is God speaking, Jesus. But not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and stomach for food. But God will destroy both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raises the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are member of Christ himself? You know, reading this, I'm going, ah, oh, man, John always hits me with an arrow every time he gives me one. But it, we sometimes get self-centered because there's no one more important than us. And, uh, you know, reading this, I think, yeah, we get full of it sometimes. 
But in the scope of things, God is great. Jesus is our Savior. And everything should be for them. May we bow our heads. Dear God, we thank you for the weather, everything you give us. We are complainers, and this is part of our nature. But you make things great. You give us what we need, not what we want. And this, for, and this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning. Last couple of mornings with the return of sky and no smoke, I've watched the sunrise and they've been so glorious. You can't help but say, may Jesus Christ be praised. And that's what we're going to sing first this morning. When morning gilds the sky, would you stand with me?
It's that time where I ask you, dig in that pocketbook. Come on, we can dig it a little deeper. And it's interesting, I, I watch some of the old uh, TV uh, uh, religious shows sometimes. And it's interesting because the whole thing basically boils down to one thing, giving. And it gets you worked up. I can't get you worked up today, but, you know. And, and they throw guilt on you, like, if you're not, if you're not really, you know, putting it in there where everyone can see, you know, and you got to give it a little more than the guy next to you. And I loved Oral Roberts. I loved that guy because he had big buckets, and he didn't want to hear metal hitting the bottom. He wanted folding money. And, and I thought, you know, there's one. I, just, I had a little crystal radio set. Those old enough will know if you got one for Christmas, you were top dog. And um, Reverend Ike. And he was just up front. If I was Reverend Ike, I'd go, today's Cadillac day. And the Cadillac then was $6,850. And that's what we're raising tonight in the name of the Lord. And I'm going, wow, the guy's up front. You know, we're not beating around the bush. And, uh, and then at the end, they go, God is great. We raise more than what a Cadillac cost. You know, and so praise God. And I'm thinking, wow, what a way to raise money. But I don't think God and his son Jesus worked that way. You know, give what you can, give with your heart, and I will take care of the rest. You know, I think we all can admit that God's been great in our lives. Doesn't mean everything's peaches and cream all the time. But in the end, God comes through. He delivers. And in the bad times, we think there's no end. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. But there is. We're just not looking. And by God holding our hands, he will guide us through. May we say a little prayer? Thank you, God. Thank you for what you give us. We give so little in return, and we expect so much, but you give us what we need, not what we want. And we need to be appreciative of everything you do in our lives. Amen. I don't even have to say it. They're coming up. All right. <laughs> Come on, kids. All right, now that you're all sitting down, I'm, we're going to take a little tiny, itty-bitty little field trip in a second, okay? Because I want to talk to you about how awesome God is. You know God is awesome, right? And God has done some amazing things in the way that God has created us. He's made us who we are. And we have, what are these at the end of my arms? Hands. What are these at the end of my hands? fingers. What are these? Eyes. What are these? Ears. You got it. And all of these things help us do things in the world. And it, I don't know we even think about it. It just happens. But it is so amazing. So here's our field trip. Before you go, I need to tell you that we have to be careful. 
because we're going to go on the other side of this barrier and those are not attached to the floor. And so we can't bump into them, they'll fall over. Okay, so let's be careful, all right? So let's go around the other side of this barrier. And we're going to look at this piano and Marta's going to help us. Okay, so don't bump into the barriers, right? Okay, all right. But come around the piano so that you can see it. And I'm going to lift this up. So you guys know what sound is? Yeah. What is sound? Tell me. It's like a string. Like a string? What, what do you think? Sound is one of the five senses that we hear things with sound. Here's what sound is. Sound is a vibration. You know when you're like driving down the road in your car or you're shaking like this? That's like a vibration. Sound is like a vibration. And it vibrates through the air. You know, if you didn't have any air, you wouldn't have any sound. So you have to have air. God thought of that, okay? And vibrations go out in all different directions and they end up going right to your ears. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on back over here. All right, now, what I need you to do, and I want to I wanna have uh, maybe a couple of people, what? Right. The you're right. You're right. We're going to... When she touches a the key, they, like, vibrate. You got it. These strings vibrate. You're absolutely right. Now, I'm going to pick a volunteer. Can you do this? No? It's super, it's super easy. Real gentle. I want you to put your hand just on those, no, the big strings down at the bottom. Just kind of hold on to them. And then Marty's going to play. Do you feel it? It's vibrating, isn't it? Well, not there because she's up here in the higher notes now. But if she's down at there, kind of feel them a little bit. So that vibration in the string goes out into the world, into the air around us. And then it hits us in the ear, which is this part of us. And it goes inside of our ear. And then there's an eardrum in there, a very thin membrane that vibrates exactly the same as the note that Marta is playing. And it goes into our brain and it tells us that's what this is. Now, sounds and vibrations aren't really interesting that much, are they? They're just sounds and vibrations. But what happens when you put those sounds together into something? So, hands off the, the wires. Can Marty, can you play something pretty? Isn't that beautiful? All of these vibrations together are coming and touching our ears and going into our brains. And we hear something and it's awesome. Now, let's go back around. This top is so heavy. I want to make sure they're out of the way before we do anything with it. Thank you, Marta. So, God says that he has made us in fearful and wonderful ways. Fearful maybe in the sense that we don't understand it completely, but wonderful in the sense that we get to enjoy some amazing things, right? Just vibrations in the air turn into beautiful music. What is the most amazing thing that you've heard? Just think about that. But not just what you've heard. What's the most amazing thing that you have seen with your eyes? What's the most amazing thing that you tasted with your tongue? The most delicious thing. Oh, oh my goodness. Pizza. <laughs> Spaghetti. All of these things, God has given us the capacity to enjoy these things in our lives because God loves your body as much as he loves your soul and your spirit. And he's given you special gifts in order for you to enjoy this life. So whenever you get to feel like, oh, there's nothing cool in life, just think of how God has made you to enjoy things and enjoy those things that, that are simple. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the way that you have made us in such fearful and wonderful ways. And they are wonderful we think of the way that you created this very complex thing that is sound with the vibrations in the air and the different things that resonate and the way that our body can sense those things in our ears. We are so grateful that you've made us in such a wonderful way. Lord, help us to enjoy this world in a way that gives you honor, listening to good music and praising you in worship. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, thanks. You guys can go.
please stand again. My Jesus, I love thee. avoided disaster. <laughs> I've used this text before in our scriptures for our services as we've talked about this idea of spiritual formation because it is the text. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, Paul writes to the church there in Rome, I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Again, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I always enjoy that word holy because it makes me think of two different things. Holy, sanctified, being righteous, but also completely. We offer ourselves to God completely. That is what we are called to do. Dave had this a wonderful illustration and a, and, a, and a thought on giving. And I'm going to just say yes, but God also wants everything. Everything. So you can give some today, but God's going to come back and get the rest of it eventually. We're talking about that today. And I want to begin by talking a little bit about Elijah, this prophet from the Old Testament. Elijah was in trouble. He was, he was in hot water. Now, there's obviously more to this story than we have time to tell. And if you want to read it, you can go to 1 Kings. It's in chapters 18 and 19 there. But suffice it to say that Elijah even after this wonderful great victory that he has on Mount Carmel over the false priests of, of Baal and Asherah, Elijah is fleeing for his life from the rage of the queen Jezebel. At the beginning of chapter 19, it says this, Ahab, the king, Ahab, told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying this, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. 
Okay, that's not a veiled threat. That is an overt threat. That is definitely something that's going to get you a little bit worked up. And so Elijah, fearing for his life from Jezreel, where he is, he runs to Beersheba. And when I say run, I mean literally. He's afoot here. He runs to Beersheba. His servant is with him. He leaves his servant there in Beersheba, and he heads out into the desert, a day's journey, on his own, by himself. And at this point, Elijah is done. He's at the end of his rope. He's at the end of his strength. He has lost all hope. And he finds this tree, a broom tree, and he sits down underneath it, and he waits to die. He is done. I've had enough, God I've had enough. Just let me die here. I get to thinking this. I'm amazed that he would say these kinds of things. And I probably need to resist the temptation to go, oh, poor Elijah. Because we shouldn't get too hard on him. This is one of the greatest prophets that there is. His faithfulness is legendary. He'd seen countless of these miraculous acts of God here at this moment where he is out in the desert underneath his broom tree waiting to die. He's right between two very powerful events. First, that that fire from heaven that had come down when he prayed to Yahweh, when he prayed to God and consumed not just his offering, not just the wood that it was on, but the rocks and all of the water that he had poured on it as well, all of it consumed by the power and the the majesty of God. Amazing thing. And that's enough for the people of Israel who are witnessing that to go and kill all of these false prophets and priests. And he's on his way somewhere from this place. He's on his way out to that miraculous encounter with God on Mount Horeb that that we all hear so much about where he finally hears God's voice coming out of that silence. And it wasn't in the fire and the earthquake and the mighty wind. And so this is a guy who is intimately acquainted with God's amazing power and presence. He knows God. And yet, here he is. Defeated and deflated, just ready to die. Now, I don't, I don't want to read too much into these verses, but, but I also don't want to overly spiritualize them as well and keep this in some kind of a theoretical, theological world. Look at what God does here. Look at what God does in response to Elijah's lament. Oh, just let me die. God sends a messenger, an angel. And this angel doesn't come to Elijah and go, you need to quit your complaining. You need to straighten up and fly right here, Elijah. Hasn't God always been with you? Weren't you there when the fire came down from heaven? Doesn't taunt Elijah. The angel doesn't remind Elijah about the miracles and the victories. He doesn't teach Elijah some kind of new spiritual truth. He says exactly what Elijah needs to hear in that moment. Because the one that sent this messenger knows what Elijah needs. The angel says to Elijah, get up and eat. Here's bread. Get up and eat. You see, Elijah's spirit cannot be restored unless his body goes first. That's what we're talking about today. I hope you've gotten the picture. We've been in this journey through the process of spiritual formation. We've been talking for a number of weeks about this idea that God wants to transform us, transform all of us. Again, God's coming for all of it, so get ready here. We've been talking about this way that God wants us, every part of us, to be shaped in the likeness of Christ. And We might be tempted, because it's church, to think about this in spiritual terms, theological terms. This is where we are. This is what makes sense here. And we need to do that, and I don't want to discount it. A lot of spiritual formation is spiritual in nature. It's enacted by the Spirit of God in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. But when we talk about formation in this way, in this holistic way, then we have to accept that God isn't interested in just part of us. No. God is interested in all that we are. Every part of us. And if that's true, 
then we have to accept that all of who we are includes the physical part of who we are, too. Last week, we talked about our vocation, our work, the things that we do in the world. That has a very real, very physical manifestation. The work that we do shows up in the material world that we inhabit. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about our physical bodies, these things that we walk around in and, and move and, and act in, the ears and the eyes and the elbows and the knees, and what we're supposed to do with them in terms of being a faithful follower of Jesus. So what does spiritual formation mean in terms of our physical body? First of all, I'm guessing this, that perhaps maybe we're not really familiar with talking about this in church. This may not be something that comes up very often, but we need to establish that it is a legitimate thing to think about and to talk about for the believer in Christ. There's a reason that we don't hear a lot of sermons and we don't have a lot of teaching about the theology of the body because we're suspicious of this thing that God has put us in, this body that we all have, because it seems often, frequently, repetitively perhaps, to fall short of what we want. It doesn't work the way we think it should. It gets sick. I know there's a lot of our sisters and brothers today who are homesick. It gets sick and it gets broken. It falls into diseases. It ages. It starts to come apart on us. All right? It is, frankly, the focal point of a lot of temptations, things that we would like to resist but don't seem to be able to. The human body, it seems so representative of that brokenness and the impermanence of the world that we can't really help but treat it with a certain degree of suspicion, maybe even mortification. Let's not talk about our bodies. We don't want to do that. This human body that we have, it represents pain and limitations and often the consequence of sin. Many of us, frankly, we're just ready to be done with it. <laughs> we're ready to be, be, be rid of it, to shuck off this mortal coil. That's the language that gets used often. To leave this broken earthly body behind and move on to glory. Hallelujah, right? There are all kinds of songs about this. We sing about this at times. But it's not really what the Bible says about our bodies. While there is certainly truth to this, this idea that the body has imperfections and has limitations, the Bible might caution us about our desire to be rid of this body because God has given us this body. This is the body that God has gifted to us. It's been given to us for a great purpose. And God believes that our bodies, even though we don't often agree with him on this, God believes our bodies are good. Now, part of the reason that we're ambivalent about our body is that we, to a certain extent, are still influenced by those ancient Greeks. How they thought about things, we still think about them. I don't know, it's like 3,000 years later, you think we'd be moved on by this. But we still think in the terms that the Greeks would be familiar with. One of the ideas that they came up with was this idea of what they called dualism. Spiritual material, two different worlds. The spiritual, the immaterial, that's perfect, that's good, that's everything that's ideal. The material is just a shadow, a reflection of this perfect world. This is fallible, this is broken, this is something we want to get rid of. Perfection exists in the immaterial. That's a Greek idea. And it's still sort of the way that we think about things, even as Christians. But it's not really a Christian principle. Now, that's not to say that God is willing to take all this imperfection that we see around us and we experience it and say, oh, yeah, it's no big deal and embrace it. That's not really what we're talking about. But God is very much invested in this material, physical world. He created it, after all, right? This is all God's doing that we see and we experience around it. God created this, and what did he call it? Good. Good. Yeah, it's not perfect at this point. There is sin, there is the fall, but it is good. I mean, that little song that Marta played, how beautiful is that? It's just vibrations in the air, people. And how beautiful is that? 
it's good. So it is still what God sees and what God loves, and that includes our physical bodies. God put this dirt together that is you and I, this, this dust, and, and breathed life into it, and God loves that dirt and that dust. Now, broken as our bodies are, they are still very precious to God. And if you need any evidence of this, well, I'll just point you to Jesus. Jesus. Isn't it a glorious thing that God's redemptive plan, this plan that's been in the works since the beginning of, of our human history, our time, isn't it a glorious thing that it has a physical element to it? Because it does. It absolutely does. Think about this. Of all the different ways that God could have redeemed us, could have, God could have made us whole, he does it by putting on a material, physical body. Go to John 1, the first chapter of John's gospel. In the first chapter, John, the evangelist says this, and the word became flesh. The word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. That is an earth-shaking announcement. The Word became flesh. The Word, if you, again, look at that verse. The Word, pre-existent, before all things, in the beginning, with God, and actually is God. The Word, the one through whom all things come into existence, all of creation comes about. The Word. That ultimate source of life and light for all people. The Word. A perfect spiritual reality becomes flesh. like you and me, becomes flesh. Think about that. Think about how radical that is. Amazing that is. There's a, a theological term that we use to describe this, incarnation. Incarnation. That's a powerful word, really, when you think about it. It, it basically means this, becoming meaty. Did you catch it? Becoming meaty. All right, because carn, that word that's right in the middle of incarnation, is literally flesh, meat, a carnivore. That's a meat eater. Carne asada on your tacos, grilled meat. This is what the word means. And the language might make you uncomfortable. Ooh, I don't want to think of Jesus in that way. Becoming meaty, that seems odd. It just goes to show how much we've spiritualized Jesus, right? how we've lost sight of this whole truth that we have, that Jesus became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. This is what God does. Oh, man. And if it's important to God, if it's so important to God that it would be such an integral part of his redemptive plan that he would put on flesh and dwell among us, then we need to pay attention to it, to that fleshy earthy, meaty part of who we are, our bodies. So, the Romans 12 passage, okay? Well-known passage. We've read it already a few times in our, in our journey through spiritual formation. But we read that. And Paul says in that text, he says that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Pay attention to that. Present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Paul uses the Greek word soma. In English it gets translated as body. Soma. Literally that is the physical part of who we are. Sometimes when they use the word they include the spirit, they include the soul, but they never exclude the physical body. It always has that as a component. When soma is used and body is used, this is what we're talking about. This stuff. This stuff. And so, Paul says that we are to offer our bodies, our soma, as a living sacrifice. It's great stuff. Paul is having a good time here, okay? Paul's contrasting all of the, the sacrificial bodies of bulls and rams and sheep and goats and all of that. He's contrasting those dead bodies that would have been used in all of the religious rituals, the Jewish ones and the pagan ones as well. 
with these living bodies that the people of God represent. Those bodies are not living. This one is. And so there's a rich irony to this. Paul's really riffing on this. and It's great. And the first readers in Rome, yeah, they would have got it. They said, oh, I see what you did there, Paul. That's clever. But he's also introducing a really innovative concept. Something that they probably hadn't thought about before. That the believer's human physical body, their soma, can be offered, can be given as a sacrifice. And not, not just an adequate one, like, well, this is kind of the best you get, so you do what you can with it. Okay, but as a holy one, a sanctified one, an acceptable one, one that is a reasonable worship, pleasing to God. It's what God wants when it comes to sacrifices. The, the prophetic message of the, whole test, the Old Testament, it's, it's very consistent here. God is far more interested in what we do with our physical bodies, how we move in the world, how we are obedient and faithful. He's far more interested in that than he is all of the dead flesh, the slaughtered animals, the goats, the rams, the bulls. He doesn't care about that stuff. What he cares about, and this is consistent throughout the new covenant as well, what he cares about is how we live our living sacrifice, our obedience, our faithfulness, doing justice and, and loving kindness and walking with humility. They're always going to be a more pleasing and holy sacrifice. So these actions, these obedient and pleasing and faithful actions, these can only be realized, they can only be exhibited by a living, moving, somewhat broken physical body. It's the only way that they come into the world. A living sacrifice. So, I hope we've established this now. I hope we've established that, that God made us, right? That's where we started all those weeks ago. God made us, right? God made our bodies. God made this thing. That, that moves around and acts and speaks and does the stuff that it does. And God not only thinks that that is good, but that it has a purpose, a holy, pleasing, and reasonable purpose to be that offering, that sacrifice. God's love for our physical selves is so great that his redemptive plan includes Jesus putting on flesh, becoming physical like we are a body Becoming like us in every way, except sin. And it was the death of that physical body, the body of Jesus, executed on the cross for us, that made redemption possible. Is that amazing? I mean, we, it's like, yeah, this is what happens, you know, on the days leading up into Easter. We, we, we remember this, we commemorate it, we celebrate the resurrection. That was Jesus' physical body that was on that cross, that is what made redemption possible. You think that physical bodies aren't important. Think about that. And then after revealing himself in the resurrection, it was a physical body that was resurrected, people. Okay, this is great. This is in Luke 24. He goes to Emmaus, and he reveals himself to those guys. They break bread together. They eat. And then he comes back to Jerusalem. The two travelers come back. Oh, wow, we've seen Jesus. And they get back, and then Jesus, bang, shows up in their midst. This is what it says. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And they freaked out. They literally freaked out because what are we talking about here? This guy was dead. We saw him die. We saw his body die. We saw his body buried. So what are we left with? Must be a ghost. Must be a spirit. Because the body is gone. And Jesus goes, why, why are you frightened? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> why are you frightened? Why are you frightened? And why do such doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. And see that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have Flesh and bones, like I have. Flesh and bones. 
and what Jesus has and what Jesus celebrates, we should never treat with contempt. Our flesh and bones are important to God. So what does this mean? What does it mean in terms of spiritual formation? Who we are supposed to become as children of God? How might God want to transform this physical part of us? All right, now I say that phrase and immediately we are probably thinking something. We're not talking about that kind of transformation that you're going to see on television or social media. You remember the show, The Biggest Loser? You know, it's like we're going to get big guys like me up there and we're going to, we're going to treat them, you know, run them through the mill uh, and then they're going to come out from behind. And still, not that kind of transformation. Okay, we're not talking about that. The transformation here that God is interested in is not a transformation of the physical form, but a transformation of what we are using our physical forms for. Are our bodies what Paul talks about in Romans? Are they that living sacrifice that we are offering to the true God, or do we offer our bodies to some other God? Too often because we've, we've lost sight of the fact that God is very interested in our physical bodies and how we use them, we get caught in the extremes. We're either neglectful, and honestly this is where most of us are, not taking care of this living sacrifice that we were supposed to be offering to God, or we're overly invested in making our bodies into something that we want them to be. We either give our bodies to the gods of sloth and comfort and ease or we offer them to the god of self-worship and the god of worldly beauty. Trust me, neither one of these extremes is acceptable. Obviously, there are those that worship the human form. That's all they think about. It's all they're, they're obsessed about. Our media is full of examples here. It's on all the billboards and all of the, 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 the ads on television. It's everywhere. We see it all around us. Worldly beauty, athletic prowess. We just had the Olympics. It's amazing what these people can do. They've trained their bodies. They've disciplined their bodies in such a way. And we can be inspired by that. We might even celebrate when those athletes give glory to God. But too often that pursuit of excellence and what the world defines as excellence of, of beauty as some kind of a concept of perfection can be more about self-worship. Look at what I have accomplished and how awesome I am and how pretty I've become. More about that than being a pleasing and holy and acceptable worship the way that Paul is referring to it. But, but let's, let's be honest. How many of us are over here? Now, we're usually over here on the other side of things. If we're, if we're honest about things, most of us choose that way. Only a slim percentage take this route. Most of us don't eat well. I know, we had an ice cream social last night. This is a really hard sermon to preach after an ice cream social. I had three bowls of ice cream. They were small bowls, okay? We don't eat well. We don't get enough sleep. We rarely exercise, and then we wonder why we're not feeling well. I don't know what's wrong with me. I do. At least I know what's wrong with me. We let stress run over our lives. We, we don't manage our time well. Think about it. Okay, that, that preening weightlifter, you know, in, oh, in, the, in the mirror at the gym. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to be that. We, we recognize who they're offering their body to, but isn't it just as bad to offer a body to God that we haven't cared for, that we haven't tended to appropriately. You remember that parable of the talents, you know, the, the master giving the five and the two and the one talent to his servants and the one that goes out and buries it. Is that what, the way we're treating our bodies? Ignoring them until the master returns? He gets reprimanded. So what do we do? Do we take care of what we have been given? And again, we're not trying to achieve perfection here. That's beyond our grasp on this world. But simply being good stewards of the things that we've been given, including our bodies. That's been given to us in trust. We're responsible for it. And we can't separate the stewardship of our bodies from the stewardship of our souls. It is all a piece. Again, that word holy and holy as in complete. The passage that Dave read from the beginning in 1 Corinthians 
Um, there was a part of that that I, he was grateful not to have to read um, because that part of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 talks about sexual morality and sexual immorality and doing things that we shouldn't do sexually in our bodies. So we're not going to dwell much on that, but that is the context that we're referring to, sexual purity. The people in Corinth, they were, they were participating in some pretty aberrant behavior when it comes to Christian belief. Okay, going to the temple and engaging temple prostitutes. And that's what Paul was calling them out on. It was completely unacceptable to Paul. But that last line that Dave read, that's the one I want you to pay attention to. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? He's talking about physical bodies here. Your body is a member, just like your soul, just like your spirit. Your body, this physical part of who you are, belongs to Jesus. So what we do with our bodies is important to God. God is paying attention to my three bowls of ice cream. There is no part of who we are that is irrelevant to God. It's all part of his plan. Heart, soul, mind, strength. So, I don't know what your plans are for dinner, but it matters. God is interested in what you are eating. God is interested in the things that you drink. God is interested in how much sleep you get and how you let stress into your life, how you manage that stretch, how much exercise you get. God is interested in these things. It all matters to God. Not because God wants to be, you know, your personal trainer and looking over your shoulder going, oh, you probably shouldn't have done that. That's, we're not going to go there. God doesn't necessarily want us to be perfect physical specimens because, again, we are human and we are broken. There's maybe too much temptation in trying to be perfect. It leads towards self-worship. But God wants us to take care of our bodies, to tend to our bodies, because if we don't take care of a gift, then how much are we honoring the one who has given it? We can't be a fully faithful follower of Jesus if we're not tending to all of it. I'm grateful for forgiveness for my three bowls of ice cream. But hey, I see this. If we're supposed to be doing these things that God wants us to do, doing justice, loving kindness, walking with humility, then how our bodies work, how they function in that doing is important to God. Last week we talked about vocation, the work that we do, the things that we do with our hands, the, the way that we inhabit this world with our productivity and, and so forth. And it's woven together with how we treat our bodies. Simply put, we cannot do what God wants us to do. We cannot fulfill the calling that God has put on our lives if we don't care, take care of that very singular instrument that God has given us to fulfill that calling. I don't know about you all, I don't have a spare John in the closet. Okay, there is not another one of me that I can tap to do these things. I only have this, and you only have that. That's all we have to do the work that God has given us to do. That's it. And so we need to take care of it. We know that God created our bodies. We know that God has given them to us as a gift. Being born, oh, the grace of that. The grace of that. Yeah, I didn't ask to be born. Kids say that sometimes. You were given that chance, that opportunity to exist in this beautiful world. Being born is an act of God's grace. Now, we know you're all thinking about something, I'm sure. We know that our bodies are finite. We know that they have a beginning and an end. This is what we have been promised. From dust we are made and to dust we will return. This is what our human bodies are, in their present form, they're not going to last forever. But this does not negate the fact that they are still precious to God. God loves dirt. <laughs> he loves it a lot. 
God loves us a lot. And so this is a gift that has been given in love. And it is loved. And we're supposed to care for our bodies in a way that honors the giver. Seriously. I mean, you've given gifts to kids, right? And they've been like, eh, I don't really care about that. How does that make you feel? So how does God feel when we treat the gifts that he gives us that way? You can just think about that. It's not just to give honor to the, the giver, the gift that we treat our bodies a gift, though. These, these bodies have been given to us. Each one of us has received this gift of a body so that we can fulfill the purpose that God has given us. And we can't really fully realize that purpose. We can't fully do that thing that we're meant to do if our bodies are broken down and glitchy because we haven't taken care of them. We can't neglect our bodies, nor can we become so bound up in caring for them that, that it becomes a form of idolatry. We need to find that place in the middle where we are good stewards of the things that God has given us. We simply have to ask ourselves, God, what do you want me to do in this world? And then take care of the tools that he's given us to do it. Let's pray. Lord, this isn't always an easy thing for us to face because if there's one part of us that is prone to temptation and falling into disrepair, it is our bodies. Lord, we know that in their finiteness that there is a part of them that, that will not last for eternity, but that is no excuse. And when we are less than compassionate and less than caring and less then responsible with these gifts that you've given us, we ask that you would forgive us. Lord, we pray that you would give us the conviction and the courage and the strength to take care of all of these precious things, our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength, the strength of our somas and our bodies so that we might be more faithful to you. We pray all this in the name of the one who became flesh so that we might live. Jesus, amen. Lord, we will depart from this place to go into this world that you have created. We recognize that it is not all that it could be. We recognize that there is sin and there is brokenness. It shows up in so many different ways, but we also know that it is precious to you. Each individual in it is precious to you. Each individual in this room is precious to you. You love it all so much, and you love us so much. Lord, that is a superabundance of love more than we can contain and so we will take it into the world and we will share it with those that need it. We'll be that light and that salt until we gather again to praise and worship you. We will go in peace. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>